Well, in the past several episodes, uh, we've been in the area around Bastogne, where uh, some of the most vicious fighting during the Battle of the Bulge took place. And uh, right now, if you look at this building behind me, uh, this is the, the Bastogne Barracks. This is the place that served as the headquarters for uh, General McCulloch, who was the commander of the 101st Airborne during the Battle of Bulge. Uh, well, we've got an artifact that we brought back today that is connected with a man who was right here in these barracks during the Siege of Bastogne. All right, now we're in a different part of the Bastogne Barracks, and, and I didn't even know this, but uh, apparently here at the Barracks, they have a rather extensive military vehicle museum. So uh, I, I've not been in here. Uh, Eric tells me that he hasn't been in here since they've got like their new facility, uh, but that there's a, a lot of stuff here, like a lot. So, so we're going to take a, a quick look at some of the military vehicles here at the barracks and then uh, we, we have something that, that we're going to show with the guy who was here during the Battle of the Bulge. All right, uh, we just walked into this vehicle museum here and holy smokes, looks like they have got a lot to look at. So we're going to take a, a quick walk through here. We're, we're on a pretty tight time crunch today. Uh, but we're going to take just a, a quick look at, at some of these vehicles and look at what some of the Americans and Germans might have used during the Battle of the Bulge and World War II in general. So right here is, as soon as you walk in, they have a German Pac-38. Uh, this shot a 50 millimeter round or 5 centimeter round and uh, replaced the earlier Pac-36, which was you know, found to be too weak against Soviet armor. Uh, the the Pac-36 uh, was uh, almost kind of like a, a pea shooter uh, when the the Germans were fighting up against the, the Soviets. Uh, but anyway, again, this shot a 50 millimeter round. Uh, they eventually upped it again with the Pac-40 uh, to uh, a heavier round. But anyway, uh, this would be an anti-tank weapon that could destroy armored vehicles. Here in the museum, they also have an example of a German half-track. Uh, so uh, the, the German half-tracks were used uh, similar to how the Americans used them. Uh, they would transport troops or they would haul artillery pieces. Or as the uh, American threat from the air became more of an issue, well, they would arm them with anti-aircraft guns. I think this is a 37 millimeter. Uh, and then you can see, you know, they got this little rangefinder on there as well. Uh, but anyway, uh, again, so the half tracks could be used for a number of different purposes. Uh, they also had armored cabs. This one uh, doesn't. You can see it's got like the, the canvas on top. But anyway, the, these were used quite a bit during the Battle of the Bulge. All right, let's take a look at a few American vehicles. What we're looking at right now is an M5 Stuart tank. Uh, the, the Stuart tank was a, a light tank, more of a reconnaissance vehicle. Here you can see uh, an archival photo of one. Uh, so because it's a light tank with light armor and light armament, it's not really equipped to go up against German armor. Here on this particular model, they've you know fitted it with the, the hedgerow cutters that were used in Normandy. Uh, but anyway, uh, this thing was equipped with a 37 millimeter gun and three 30 caliber machine guns. And uh, like I said, is more of a reconnaissance vehicle. Uh, they used these in the Pacific and they could go up against Japanese tanks, but German tanks, not so much. Moving on to a little bit 
bigger model of tank. We're of course looking at a Sherman here. Uh, this particular one is an M4 A3 E2 Jumbo. Carries a 75 millimeter gun. And as you can see here on the side, they've marked it uh, first in Bastogne. So this tank represents a tank that was nicknamed the Cobra King. Uh, it's not the exact tank, but, but just represents the one that was the first to break through the Bastogne encirclement in December of 1944. Uh, so as you can see here, bears the markings of the 4th Armored Division. They were in Patton's 3rd Army. And again, they were the first ones to, to break through the Bastogne perimeter. Uh, so as I mentioned, the main gun, as you can see there, is a 75 millimeter gun. Uh, it also had two 30 caliber machine guns and a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, in a later episode, we're actually going to go and show exactly where the 4th Armored broke through the Bastogne perimeter. But yeah, it was a, with a tank like this one. Moving down the line, we have a, another model of Sherman here. And as you can see, this one seems to be equipped with a little bit bigger gun. Uh, so this version of the Sherman tank uh, is equipped with a 105 millimeter howitzer. So they would use this for indirect fire uh, on you know targets that, that weren't directly visible from the tank. So it would be powerful enough to take out enemy field fortifications, could also destroy other tanks uh, with rounds like this. Uh, so this is an M67 HEAT, which stands for High Explosive Anti-Tank. Uh, that's not the core mission of this model, uh, but anyway, it could be used for that. And during the Battle of the Bulge, they really relied on this model of tank. Moving on to another country's armaments here. Uh, this is a Soviet flat gun. Uh, so this particular anti-aircraft gun was designed for 85 millimeter shells and was kind of the standard anti-aircraft piece of equipment for the Soviet Union. When the Germans were moving through the Soviet Union, they captured quite a few of these and then kind of transformed them to suit their own troops. So the German version, of course, would have shot an 88 millimeter shell. There you can see one of the 85 millimeter shells right there. Uh, I'm assuming that's 85 millimeter. But anyway, yeah, here's an example of a Soviet flat gun. Now, during our visit to the Hurtgen Forest, I talked about the weasel quite a bit, and I didn't have one to show. Well, here's an example of a weasel. So these were designed for missions for like supply and for casualty transport. And, and these things were just as handy as a pocket on a shirt. They, they could be airlifted or dropped by parachute and were, were really used a lot on the Western Front. Well, what we are looking at here is officially known as an M16 multiple gun motor carriage. Uh, it's basically M16 half track and uh, this was developed in 1943 and developed as an anti-aircraft weapon. Uh, so you can see here it's equipped with four uh, 50 caliber machine guns. It's on a gun carriage that can rotate 360 degrees. There are body plates uh, or side plates there that can be folded down. And as the Allies kind of achieved air dominance, well, this was increasingly used for infantry support and was nicknamed the meat grinder for obvious reasons. This squatty looking thing right here is called a Jagdpanzer 38. So it's kind of like a, a tank destroyer of sorts. It's equipped with a 75 millimeter gun. And, and as you can see, it has a, a low profile, which makes it suitable for ambush and for taking out tanks. Uh, it was kind of an inexpensive vehicle, so they made around 2,500 of these, and they continued making them after the war. All right, 
Uh, well, that is just a little bit uh, from the, the vehicle museum here at Bastogne Barracks. And when I say a little bit, I mean a little bit. Like there's a whole other building that we didn't even film in. So we're, we'll have to come back here at some point. Uh, but anyway, have something else that we want to show today. We just walked into one of the, the buildings here at the barracks. And this is a room that shows all of the veterans who came back in their later years to visit the barracks. And I'm gonna point out just a few of them here in just a moment. But first, uh, I also wanted to, to show this. So what we are looking at are photos of uh, Rene Lemire uh, on the left, and also Augusta Chouy on the right. Uh, Augusta Chouy was from the Belgian Congo, and uh, Rene Lemire, if you've watched the series Band of Brothers, uh, you are familiar with her story. She was a nurse here in Bastogne uh, who was killed here during the battle, but look at this. They have her original Legion of Merit here, right in this room. Uh, now, uh, Augusta Chouy also received a Legion of Merit, but that has remained with the family. And I uh, just want to point out, you know, uh, a few of these veterans, and some of them you may be familiar with, like this man right here, uh, Bill Garnier from Easy Company of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, and then they have, you know, some... British veterans who came back. Uh, here's somebody from the 80th Division. Here's Ed Shames, also from Easy Company of the 506th. Uh, here's also another Easy Company veteran. As a matter of fact, this was the last surviving veteran of Easy Company, Brad Freeman. Uh, had a chance to meet him once. Uh, just a, a heck of a guy and was good friends with, uh, with Eric. Um, oh, and there's Jack Moran. I know Jack. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's going. Uh, he's, he's appearing in several uh, videos throughout this uh, throughout this series. Uh, yeah, Jack was in the 87th uh, Infantry Re or Infantry Division. Uh, let's see. Here's Earl One Lung McClung. He was here. Uh, let's see. I'm just gonna see if I can point out a few others. Here's somebody from the 17th Airborne. Um, let's see, I saw a few others here that, that were familiar. Um, oh, here we go. Here's Don Malarkey. Um, here's Babe Heffron. And, uh, there's a, another gentleman who visited the, the barracks here, who was also in the 101st Airborne Division. This man. Norwood Thomas. I have with me a photo of Norwood Thomas, who was in the 101st Airborne Division, uh, Division Artillery, and he was a good friend of mine. Uh, behind me is the Bastogne Barracks. A uh, brief little history on Norwood. He um, jo joined the paratroopers early on. He was in one of the first units that went through jump school, and um, he, was a, he, he was a radio man with Division Artillery, and so he did a lot with communications and um, became an expert in that field. So during the Normandy jump, he was in the same stick as General McCullough. And um, during the Holland jump, um, they pulled a lot of the division artillery guys into gliders because of some, because of the artillery um, um, losing their daisy chains. They, they had the, the guns broken down and um, they had this idea that the artillery, the, the airborne artillery should all be in gliders for Holland. So, so what's unique about that is Norwood Thomas is one of just a, 
a few of the 101st Airborne that did a combat parachute jump in Normandy and a combat glider landing in Holland. By the time he got to Bastogne <clears throat> here, behind me is the Bastogne Barracks. Norwood Thomas set up some radio communications for General McAuliffe in the Bastogne Barracks. And uh, he was sent out to send some wiring out to some of the uh, artillery uh, observation posts and communication areas. And while he was in a Jeep um, driving down this road, he was hit by German artillery. The Jeep flipped and he flew out of the Jeep and, and was knocked unconscious. He woke up and he said that the first thing he saw was a nun. So he was taken to one of the hospitals here in Bastogne. He, was, he recovered there for a while. Um, he didn't have any broken bones, but he did qualify for a Purple Heart. This is Norwood Thomas's Purple Heart. And he gave that to me a few years ago. And um, a lot of his wartime items were scattered and um, he didn't really have a whole lot, but he ke always kept his Purple Heart. And he said, told me he wanted something in my museum to be displayed. So he gave me his Purple Heart really meant a lot to me because I became, as I said, really good friends with him. We toured some battlefields together. I hosted him in Gettysburg several times. And I really wanted to bring Norwood Thomas's Purple Heart back here to the site of his wounding. And um, here, he, here, this picture of, was taken not too long after he got his jump wings. And here's another picture taken later on um, towards the end of the war. But um, it's a real honor to bring Norwood Thomas's Purple Heart back to the site of his wounding. And uh, like I said, it means a lot to me. And right there's the Bastogne Barracks. It's um, very, a, a very emotional um, moment for me.